the Virginia Horse Industry Board, and the Virginia Christmas Tree Growers Association are proud sponsors of Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. This week, we travel to Richmond, where we talk to VDAC's veterinarian, Dr. Charlie Broadus, about biosecurity and the threat of avian influenza. Then Mark Viette shares tips on caring for flowering shrubs when we go in the garden. We'll also have the Ag Calendar and a Minute in the Field video. All this plus the Ag News of the Week on this edition of Virginia Farming. According to VDAX, Virginia farmers intend to plant more peanuts, oats, and hay this year, but less cotton, tobacco, winter wheat, and soybeans. Corn acreage is unchanged, but corn stocks stored in off-farm facilities on March 1st of this year was up by more than 2 million bushels compared to last year. The March 1st planting intentions are from the U.S. Department of Agriculture's National Agricultural Statistics Service. Actual plantings may change based on numerous circumstances like weather, input cost, and commodity prices. Actual plantings will be reflected in the acreage report released on June 30th. Well, two Virginia-based companies issued recalls of their products last week due to listeria, an organism which can cause serious and sometimes fatal infections to individuals with weakened immune systems. Henry's Farm Incorporated of Woodford, Virginia is recalling all packages of soybean sprouts because they may be contaminated with listeria. The products listed on your screen are being recalled by the firm. Now, these items were distributed to retail stores in Virginia and Maryland. Sabra Dipping Company is recalling approximately 30,000 cases of its classic hummus due to possible listeria contamination as well. The products listed on your screen are the recalled items. Now, no illness has been reported to date from either items, but individuals who purchased soybean sprouts distributed by Henry's Farm or Sabra Classic Hummus should return the products to the place of sale for a full refund. New research shows that millennials are demanding beef. The American Angus Association's Cindy Campbell reports just what that means for the cattle industry. Going into the recession, things didn't look so good for beef demand. But everyone can now breathe a sigh of relief, says new research from Oklahoma State University. Really, when we started looking at it, spending is back to pre-recession levels. Um, you see the impact of that price and convenience and eating satisfaction are still important contributors to buying beef product. Um, you still see demand for steaks. Um, you even have lower income households that are making more meals with meat, although that might be ground beef, but it's still using meat and that you still see a great demand for beef product, even with the recession that we've been through. Millennials, those who are 18 to 34 years old, consume more beef than those over 35. That's encouraging. Everyone says they don't know how to cook and what to do, um, but you see them cooking more in-home um, meals with meat, as well as eating meat more in restaurants, no matter whether it's full service or whether it's a quick service or whether it's the booming um, burger value chains that are out there. And so the fact that millennials are eating more beef than the other groups and that they're willing to pay for steaks and ground beef and any cut um, is huge for the beef industry. The research also pointed to a growing trend toward higher demand for branded beef products. You can look at any product, ketchup, pickles, um, just take pop. Right? Everyone has a brand that they prefer to consume. And that brand loyalty is carrying through with beef products now. You see more people that would prefer a national brand over a store brand. And so 
the impact of brands, no matter what brand it is, CAB or any brand, um, once you can gain that customer, and if you can provide them the eating satisfaction that they're looking for and a product that they like, they're gonna go back to that no matter what it costs because they know they can get the value. Brands help consumers decode the meat case and guarantee their grocery store investment is worth it. I'm Cindy Campbell. Thanks, Cindy. Another type of investment in beef scored this Virginia girl some scholarship dollars. The certified Angus beef brand awarded $26,000 to six students for their community and beef industry leadership and achievements. The top undergraduate Colvin Scholarship Award went to Elizabeth Nixon of Rapidan, Virginia, who attends Oklahoma State University. Nixon said genomic testing to help find superior animals in a herd can increase predictability and consistency, an important role science and genetics play in delivering more predictable beef sizing and high quality eating experiences. After graduation, the animal science and agricultural communications double major wants to work in the communications for the beef industry. Congratulations, Elizabeth. Well, biosecurity on poultry farms is not to be taken lightly. With the threat of avian influenza spreading east, even backyard chicken farmers need to be taking precautions. VDAX veterinarian Dr. Charlie Broadus joins us next on Ag Insights. Today we're in Richmond and we're here at the headquarters of VDAX and I'm joined by the head of the veterinary services Dr. Charlie Broadus. Dr. Broadus, thank you so much for having us here today. I'm certainly glad to be here and answer any questions. Well, the main reason we're here is to talk about biosecurity. Um, it's been in the news so much lately that the avian flu is rare in its ugly head again and is moving towards the East Coast. It is. Uh, avian influenza is a, a virus that affects birds. It can affect wild birds as well as domestic poultry. Uh, and it was first, uh, we first saw this particular strain of highly pathogenic avian influenza uh, in December of last year uh, in British Columbia, Canada, and then it moved down into, uh, into Washington and Oregon and California, and, uh, and now more recently, uh, just in the past few weeks, it's been diagnosed in the Midwest, including in Minnesota, Arkansas, and Kansas. We talk about it a lot and we hear the, the word avian flu. And of course, that perks the ears of our poultry goers. But for our general audiences, what's the big deal about, about the influenza and, and what is its effect on our farmers? Certainly, that's a, that's a real good question, Amy. The, um, the, the primary, the, the biggest reasons that it is a concern, uh, it can, certain strains of the flu can cause very significant mortality or death loss in poultry flocks, and so it can it can cause a lot of death, uh, and so that's that's uh, of course bad for the poultry affected, bad for the farmer there, bad for the food supply, um, and so that's that's one big concern. Also, influenza viruses do and, and can potentially have a uh, uh, have a, an effect on human health if they can if they change and mutate. Fortunately, the strain that we're dealing with right now does not affect human health, uh, but that is always a concern. So we always, we always keep a, a real close eye on that, anything related to avian influenza for those two reasons. Okay. Now, historically, we had a large avian flu outbreak in, did you say 2002? In 2002, and it was uh, devastating uh, to the state and particularly to the Shenandoah Valley. At that time, throughout 2002, from the time it was first diagnosed in uh, March of that year, throughout the spring and summer, uh, over 4.7 million birds were killed in order to uh, in order to prevent the further spread of the disease. Uh, it was on 197 farms uh, at that time, and really just spread very, very quickly. As anyone that, that lived through that up there uh, could could tell us. Biosecurity and prevention of spread of the disease was the, the critical element uh, there, as well as is uh, rapid response to the disease to, to try to keep it from spreading. But in that case, it, it spread very, very quickly. Now, fortunately, since that time, we have a number of mechanisms that are in place to try to prevent that from happening to that extent again. And one of those is we, uh, we do a lot of uh, the, the entire poultry industry does a lot of surveillance 
for avian influenza to try to detect it early on before it's before it spread to that extent. Okay, so you say surveillance, and that's one of my questions. How can you tell if a bird has the influenza? That's a, a, a good question, and certainly something we advise people to be on the lookout for. Um, like kind of like flu in people, uh, you can it can look like a lot of other diseases. So the same thing with flu in birds, uh, but it causes inappetence listlessness, uh, they don't want to drink as much, sometimes they can have swollen combs, uh, they can have uh, splotchiness on their legs, uh, but basically they just, they, they don't, just like a person with the flu, they don't, they don't feel good, they don't want to eat, they don't want to drink, uh, and in severe cases, uh, they die. And, and so that's, um, that's a, a, a poultry farmer will often see uh, you know, some of those signs, perhaps a decrease in egg production if it's a, if it's a laying flock. Uh, and then they'll see an increase in mortality, uh, birds dying there. And at that point, it could be any number of, of uh, causes for that type of condition, but one of the possibilities that they would be thinking of would be avian influenza. And so they'd submit either the birds or samples from them to our labs, uh, and the, the avian influenza test would be run at that point. So if a bird is diagnosed as having the avian influenza, what happens? What happens next? Is the entire flock destroyed? Yeah, it depends on the strain. The type that's circulating across the Midwest and the western part of the country or that there's been diagnoses of this year uh, is called highly pathogenic avian influenza and that is a strain that the USDA has a program for in which case according to, to their plan uh, those birds would be depopulated or humanely killed in order to prevent the further spread of disease that way. So that's with, with that particular strain. There are other strains of avian influenza where it is possible to, uh, to, to not have to kill the birds. If other measures can be taken to prevent spread of the disease, they can still be potentially, in some cases, uh, moved to humane slaughter when they're no longer infectious or, or any, any threat to other birds. So you had mentioned that it's carried by wild waterfowl. Right. So do these birds, I know that I've heard farmers say that they don't like to have the Canadian geese around because they, they are associated with being a carrier. Do those birds, are they actually carriers or do they actually have the virus? It just doesn't affect them the same way it affects poultry. It more is what you said there uh, at the end of your question. It, they, they do become infected, but uh, it doesn't tend to cause the the, the sickness and the death that it does in domestic poultry. So they'll, they'll get it to them, it's no big deal. They have a little bit of uh, flu symptoms, as we'd say, as a, as a person would, uh, but then they get better and, and, uh, and, and, and resolve, whereas that same strain could be passed on to domestic poultry and it's a whole different story. It makes them very, very sick and can kill them. Every strain is different, that's not always the case, but that's generally the, the pattern that we see with avian influenza where wild geese Wild ducks will be infected, carry it. They shed a, a tremendous number of virus particles in their droppings. So when there's uh, goose manure close by to a poultry house uh, and they pick it up that way, it can spread the disease very quickly. How do you think that the wild waterfowl are contracting the virus? They, just like flu in people, uh, it, it circulates among that population of birds. Uh, and just like flu in people, um, usually in most, most winters, the majority of us don't get the flu, but a percentage do, and it'll be the same thing in wild birds, where uh, the majority stay healthy, but uh, some, some of those populations of birds will get the flu, and there's the ones that, that spread it. That seems to be the case in the spread of the disease in the rest of the country at this point. Uh, it's, it's just basically popped up in Minnesota and in Arkansas and in Missouri, uh, and the thought is it was a uh, infected wild birds that just happen to roost on or next to those chicken or turkey houses in those cases uh, and, and spread the disease that way even though it hasn't been seen in, a, in, in all of the wild birds uh, or in a widespread uh, sample of the wild birds out in the Midwest. One of the biosecurity measures that I know that I've gone through is dipping. You know, you, you boot up with the plastic sleeves but then you always step Right. in, in right. a bath right. to make sure anything that could possibly be on your feet is killed before you enter the house. Right, and that's very important, either wet or dry foot baths to help kill any virus particles that might be on the bottom of your feet, the bottom of your shoes. As you can imagine, it's very 
very easy to inadvertently track something into a poultry house, and that's really what uh, a lot of a lot of the poultry industry is is so good at is having those birds protected. They're undercover. They're protected from natural exposure to wild waterfowl, uh, and they take those steps in there to to prevent accidental introduction of uh, a pathogen, a virus, to their flocks. Well, I think if there's if there's any good thing that came out of that outbreak in 2002, it was the biosecurity levels that that increased dramatically. And it and it's not done just because there's an outbreak somewhere we should be doing this. It's done every day. That's right. Every day is part of routine prevention. It's very important. There's nothing, uh, it's not rocket science. It's, it's similar to uh, the, the concept of washing your hands for people to prevent uh, you know, disease. The same way that we pick up something on a doorknob or something like that, uh, you know, farmers can track in on the bottoms of their feet or on their clothing or something like that. So it's just keeping in mind that, that virus could be there uh, and even if we don't see that, if we can take those routinely, take those measures uh, with clean, clean clothing, coveralls, foot baths before going into those poultry houses, it goes a long ways. Uh, backyard poultry operations, on the other hand, uh, just inherent to the way that they're, they're typically raised, they're, they're typically with uh, exposure to the outdoors and that type of thing. And, um, and so there are kind of some different considerations there, but the overall uh, the overall recommendation of biosecurity plays out the same for, for backyard poultry as well. Okay, so let's go over some of that. For people who have backyard chickens, what do they need to do to ensure that their birds don't contract this virus? Well, they, they, are, they are going to be at higher risk because of their natural exposure to the outdoors and potentially to uh, migrating Canada geese or ducks or, or, or something like that. So they just by their very nature are going to be at higher risk of, of uh, encountering the virus. Uh, and so the, the best things that the owners can do are to just be very, very vigilant about making sure not to, not to spread that disease, that potential for disease among any other bird populations. So that includes simple things like uh, making sure to not wear the same boots that you use to collect your eggs and feed your chickens uh, to go into to go into town to the feed store or something like that. That would be a, a prime way of inadvertently spreading the disease. So if you pay close attention to that, uh, wash your hands, uh, clean clean footwear and clothing. That really goes a long ways. Okay. Is there anything that our poultry producers are doing now that they should ramp up or add on? Maybe uh, another another bath or <laughs> yeah. to help? In, in light of the, the disease that we've seen out in the Midwest, we have taken the step of recommending to the poultry industry in Virginia to, to not allow any, any visitors onto the farm that don't need to be there. Uh, so, you know, certainly feed deliveries and uh, things like that are important, uh, important uh, visitors that, that need to be there. But if there's not a strong need to be there, we recommend that they don't that they don't go onto the farms. Um, and uh, any that do, we would recommend that they be in clean clothing or coveralls, uh, as well as disinfecting their, their footwear and tires of their vehicles going on and off those farms would be the, the, the heightened biosecurity recommendations to, to try to prevent disease outbreak. Okay. So if a farmer suspects that a bird may have the flu, what do they need to do, whether it's a backyard chicken or a large producer? Yep. They should be on the lookout for those signs that, uh, that I described. Uh, certainly the biggest ones would be increased, increased death loss. Um, there are a lot of different reasons that can cause that, so uh, we, we, we wouldn't assume and, and jump right to avian influenza being the cause, but it would be something to think about. Uh, and we have five labs throughout the state with VDAX uh, in those labs. That's, that's what they're there for. Uh, any of those you know, unexplained death loss can be submitted to any of those labs uh, to, for, for follow-up testing. Uh, and the listing of those labs, as well as phone numbers, can be found on our, our website, which is www.vdacs.virginia.gov. Dr. Broadus, thank you so much for, for having us out here today. It was very informative. We appreciate your time. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. We'll be right back. Flowering shrubs like butterfly bushes and crepe myrtle are beautiful additions to your garden. With tips on how best to care for them, let's join Mark Viette in the garden. 
my favorite flowering shrub, the butterfly bush. It's great to put all over your garden. But on those cold winters, we've noticed many of them die back or in some cases completely die and do not show any new growth. A couple things to remember, do not prune butterfly bushes in the fall. Ideal time to prune them is in April. Warmer areas, early April. Colder areas like the Blue Ridge Mountains, maybe mid-April. But I did learn something. My favorite way of pruning butterfly bushes is to prune them right to the ground, one to two inches from the ground. My dad, on the other hand, pruned them 24 inches above the ground. I'm gonna show you in a minute ones that were pruned to the ground, but you can look at this one here. It is dead. And if you look close at the base, you see a lot of old stubby growth, uh, stems three to four inches in diameter, and no new growth. This we have to replace. Let me show you one that I pruned and how well it's come back in the garden. You may not see the damage on butterfly bushes till May, June, maybe the beginning of July. But again, always keep in mind, you do want to trim them back if you can sometime during the month of April. Could be as late as May if need be. And what we would do is we would come in and remove any parts that are dead like this, which have been pruned. Usually I recommend a really good heavy duty loppers. But this is a butterfly shrub that is coming back. And if you look, it has been cut quite low to the ground. Try to cut it as low to the ground that is safe for you using any kind of tools. And you will find that there's a lot of basal growth, a lot of growth in the ground that comes up every year where a lot of the growth that's above the ground can freeze and be injured during those cold winter months. Crate myrtle can be as short as 18 inches or 50 feet plus. This is one of my favorites. This one is called Sioux. And as you can see, it gets about 25 to 30 feet. You can also choose the hardier varieties like Sioux. This one has not burned back with cold winter temperatures as of yet. Then you can also have some crepe myrtles like this one, which only get four or five feet tall. And with this type of crepe myrtle, you prune them to the ground every three or four years, maybe anywhere from three to six inches. Now let me show you a crepe myrtle that had lots of winter damage. Now this crepe myrtle got blasted with the winter temperatures. So it does pay to look for the super hardy types that you can buy. And in this case, sometime in May, end of May, it's usually when you can determine if they're alive or dead. Sometimes we'll take a little knife and scratch the bark just to check to see if there's any green on each bark. Uh, but really, by this time, you can see some growth coming out of the base. My recommendation is to prune this crepe myrtle low to the ground from three inches to maybe six inches above the ground, and now you can get ready for your workout. You can use all these old branches in your compost pile, and really what you're trying to do is prune back to new growth. And I would possibly come in and prune these maybe half again farther to the ground. And you can see here all the nice new growth that you've got. So, if you get those hard winters, just get out there, prune the dead out, and then you can enjoy your plants for a couple years till we get those hard, cold winters again. I'm Mark Viette, join me next time in the garden. Taking a look at the ag calendar, the third annual Market Animal Boot Camp will be held May 2nd at the Rockingham County Fairgrounds in Harrisonburg. This event will answer questions for those 4-H and FFA members interested in showing market animals. There will be opportunities to learn more about each species, receive literature, talk to feed representatives, breeders, equipment dealers, animal health specialists, and also learn more about marketing your animals. There will also be quality animals to purchase by private treaty and live auction. That does it for our show. Thanks so much for watching and have a great week. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming.
This program's brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. From apples to zucchini, Virginia farmers work hard to put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. 